good morning, everyone. This is Alyssa Knight, Knight TV Live. I hope everyone's doing well. I know pretty much everyone is working from home today. I am coming at you from the inside the containment zone of Las Vegas. <laughs> Um, so hopefully uh, all of you are well. I just wanted to remind everyone, my book is finally out. For those of you uh, who have pre-ordered it, I've been getting some uh, photos and tweets from people who have been purchasing the book and uh, who are reading it uh, as reading material uh, since they've got all this uh, work from home time. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I forget sometimes that not everyone works from home. I, I, I don't think I've actually reported into an office in like 15 years. So, um, but uh, hopefully more organizations will begin to adopt working from home practices uh, and that it extends beyond this whole uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So hopefully all of you are well and no one is sick and... Uh, we'll get on with the show. So for those of you who pre-ordered the book, um, it's, uh, it is now shipping in North America. I did receive some tweets and some messages from people, some DMs that uh, it is not shipping in other countries. Uh, I do not believe it's yet available in the UK or Europe uh, or Asia that uh, Amazon, uh, specifically US booksellers are only shipping uh, in the United States. Uh, and that started shipping on March 17th. Uh, so I have been getting some requests for some signed copies of the book. If you reach out to me uh, and um, either on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, and you would like me to sign a book, I have canceled all of my events for the year. Um, and uh, so if anyone does want to sign a book, um, I reach out to me and ship me a book and I'm happy to sign it and send it back. So uh, I promise I do not have COVID-19, uh, so you will not get sick from me. <laughs> All right, so um, on with the show. Um, so I decided to make the unilateral decision to actually um, uh, change the title of this presentation. Uh, so Caroline, uh, who's with me today, as well as Vicente, um, I apologize. Um, I did change the title of this this deck. I, I really wanted to make this more about hacking and securing IoT versus anything enterprisey. I really didn't want everyone coming in to view this presentation to think that this is an, the, another sales in our. Uh, if you've been to them, you know what I'm talking about. Companies will um, ultimately go out there and. Uh, um, you know, say, hey, we're putting on this webinar, you're going to learn how to do this, this, and this. And it turns out that they're actually just um, trying to sell you something. And it ends up being like a one hour commercial. So I didn't really want to do that with this. Um, so that's, uh, that's what's going on. So I am actually going to be explaining how people hack CCTV cameras, specifically me, um, and also uh, how people um, hack connected cars. So we're going to talk about a, little, a little bit about that and, and how to secure them and how to prevent it. So um, just a quick uh, thing on me. Uh, I am the group CEO of Briar and Thorne. Uh, I am also a partner at Night Inc. And what Night Inc. is, is uh, we're, we're a content marketing company. So yes, I, I, as you can see, I don't like to be bored. Um, so I've been running, I actually just started Night Inc. Uh, we work with cybersecurity challenger brands and market leaders in cybersecurity uh, to create content for them, whether it be blogs, white papers. Um, and uh, what I do is I blend hacking with content creation. So what I'll do, for example, is I'll hack a device or hack a network and show how that vendor's technology could have prevented it. So it's a very unique style of, of content creation. And so I like to call it adversarial content. Uh, so that I promise that's the only commercial. Uh, that's the only advertisement. Uh, I am a cybersecurity influencer. I'm a recovering hacker of 20 years. I've been doing penetration testing for about, you know, 20 years. Uh, and uh, for the last 10 years, I've been focusing my penetration testing on embedded systems. Uh, hacking embedded systems, whether it's, you know, like I said, whether it's CCTV cameras like this. Um, if you guys are interested, there is a video on my YouTube channel um, where you can actually see me dancing with the CCTV camera. It's quite entertaining. Um, and uh, uh, how I go about actually performing a pen test of a, of a camera. But I'll, talk, I'll be talking more about that in this presentation as well. 
I'm also uh, the published author of Hacking Connected Cars. Again, this book started shipping in North America on the 17th. Go pick up your copy on Amazon. There is a Kindle version um, and there are downloadable templates. So one of the things that I hated about reading other penetration testing books is um, there was this lack of... Um, there was really just this this lack of templates. You know, I love templates. I, I, I don't know about any of you guys, but I love going out there and Googling for templates, whether it's report templates or in a pen test. And I couldn't find any actual templates out there on people that are hacking connected cars. Um, actually, uh, templates for that, templates for the reports, templates for um, the risk assessments. And that's all covered in my book. And there's downloadable templates from the Wiley website. All right, so again, a cute little uh, PSD template of my books. Um, go grab your copy. That'd be amazing. And I do, I do want to bring up this. So Sentinel One had retained me to write a report on uh, their new uh, Sentinel One Ranger product. And th so I was telling Chris over at Sentinel One, Chris Bailey, amazing guy, love him to death. Uh, Daniel Bernard, hello, I love you guys too. So, uh, you know, they, they were coming out this IoT security program, like, look, Alyssa, we need you to write this paper. I was not wanting to regurgitate sales and marketing material. I wanted to do something cool. So I figured, well, what if I were to park my car in the parking lot of a bank, hack the bank through their CCTV cameras and pivot into the internal network from the camera? And so I talked about that in my paper and it was actually amazing. It was the, the most amazing paper I've ever written. Um, all right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it, it was very successful. Um, uh, there's a great report out there on it. Um, it's actually offered by IT group where I used to work as an analyst. So, uh, go grab your copy. All right. So this is how bad it is. <laughs> so right into the meat of it, let's skip the bread on the sandwich. Um, this is how bad it is. You guys can see these screenshots. Um, I didn't blur them because you guys can go out there and do this yourself. If you go in there and type in port 554 has screenshot um, on Shodan, you can see cameras throughout the world that are publicly accessible. Um, you know, here, this one is in someone's house. This is actually someone's kitchen. Uh, pff, you know, I, I just, I'm shocked. Uh, and you should be too. This is how bad the IoT attack surface is. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that things do get better. Um, and I'm hoping with webinars like this, uh, as well as some of the content that I put out there on how easy it is to hack CCTV cameras um, and, uh, you know, how easy it is to hack embedded systems in general. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm asked is, hey, let's say, you know, why is it, why is it that, that there's this problem? You know, sp specifically, let's say, for example, with cameras. And I think it's because, you know, these, these, these devices were historically never connected to the internet. These devices historically were never connected to Wi-Fi. One of the things that I find has been most systemic uh, in my research is organizations will connect their CCTV cameras to their wireless network and that wireless network is actually the wireless network for the organization. There's no micro-segmentation. Uh, and then the other problem that I'm seeing that's pretty endemic is organizations internally don't seem to know who's responsible for patching these things uh, and keeping the firmware updated. And so, you know, you have the CISO who, you know, the cybersecurity organization pointing at facilities saying, hey, look, this is your job for updating firmware on the cameras and harnessing them. And facilities is pointing their finger at cybersecurity and saying, hey, look, you know, uh, that should have been your job. And, and I can tell you that in every penetration test that I've ever performed in, uh, you know, for a client, uh, you know, is that they'll come back to me and, you know, the, they'll find out that the first pivot, the first foothold that I get will be on an IoT device. Yeah, so if you guys will go register for Showdown, you can you can do some really cool tricks with this and, and find out how bad it actually is. Here's some facts on IoT. Uh, so one billion surveillance cameras will be watching around the world in 2021, and more than half of those cameras will be in China. That's pretty scary. Like it, one billion cameras, right? And you know we can't even uh, properly secure these things and figure out how to secure them at home. And you know, th these are being built in as part of our critical infrastructure, as part of smart cities. It it's a real problem. Uh, the Americas are next in line, accounting for 18% of all installed surveillance cameras. And Asia, excluding China, accounted for 15%. Uh, 
Um, there's an estimated 770 million surveillance cameras installed around the world today, and 54% of those cameras are in China. So, you know, these numbers are going to continue to go up. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, especially in a post 9-11 world and, in, in, you know, in a world where a terrorist attack uh, is, is definitely um, uh, more possible than before, uh, you know, cameras are everywhere. And uh, uh, unfortunately, they're not being deployed securely. They're not being hardened. And in my experience, they're not even being patched regularly. By the way... I know this is a very informal webinar. If anyone's never seen me before on my YouTube channel or on my videos, I'm very um, lively. I, I keep it real. Um, yeah, this is more like a webinar slash vlog. Uh, so, if, if, uh, so just deal with it. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't keep things boring. Um, okay. So uh, that's uh, IoT facts. Let's talk about some IoT uh, vulnerabilities that I found. Now, these are not things that I just went out there and Googled. I know there's no sexy photos in this PowerPoint. Um, I actually hate PowerPoints. I, I just kind of threw this together. I, I'll point the pink elephant out in the room, I'll admit. Uh, I threw this together like 10 minutes before this, <laughs> this webinar started. Um, it's just me, the story of my life. Um, okay, so default usernames and passwords, that's a big one. Uh, in a penetration test, I'll... Uh, a lot of uh, pen testers will start with a vulnerability scan and just spray the network with Nessus or something, and then find exploitable vulnerabilities, grab like you know uh, an eternal blue, grab a foothold, and then just start pivoting. Uh, I'm a little different. I, I actually like to use Metasploits. Uh, a lot of people think that, hey, you know, Metasploit really is just for exploit. No, Metasploit has a lot of cool reconnaissance and scanning uh, uh, modules. Um, there's a lot of great scanners in there. And one of the things that I like to use is actually the web scanner. And the reason for this is I'll spray a target network looking for banners, looking for web banners. And those web banners will typically help me find IoT devices. Uh, embedded systems. Uh, I actually found a uh, an OT device uh, for building, and uh, uh, it was pretty cool. I think it was like operating the fountain or something. I asked the client what this thing does, and apparently it operated the pumps on the fountain. Anyway, uh, default username is pass and passwords. I'll go out there and I'll Google. I'll put the device name in, and then I'll I'll pull up the administrator guide for either the camera or the OT device or whatever it may be. And in the user guide, in the admin guide, they'll put the default password. This, this is the most common thing never changed. And um, a lot of these devices, believe it or not, are running, you know, uh, it's like a socket system on a chip. They'll be running a really small version of Linux. It's, it's, it's not fancy stuff, guys and girls. Um, so patch and vulnerability management, that, that's a serious problem. Uh, just RCEs, remote code execution on things like cameras. So, you know, one of the things that um, I can tell you that I used on this as well as the DVR was, and by the way, this is actually really cool. If anyone's, no one's ever seen actually the inside of a, cam of a CCTV camera, this is the outside version of the Axis camera. Um, I don't typically like to name drop companies in the middle of vulnerability research, but um, it's kind of hard for you guys to not see that logo. Anyway, uh, you guys can see that Ethernet port right there, the RJ45 Cat5 port. Um, you know, you can see that the, the thing is, the reason why I keep this open is it, they're using star screws and it's a real pain in the ass to find those damn screwdrivers. <laughs> yes. Um, put your kids to bed. I, I drop uh, four letter words a lot. Um, anyway, um, so, you know, it, the, one of the things that I noticed is, uh, especially in cameras, there's this emphasis on physical security. And I think that's just from the grassroots of, of physical security companies and it just camera companies in general is they come from the physical security world. And so I think there's this lack of emphasis on cybersecurity with devices like this. Um, but you know, remote code execution on a camera allows you to pivot around within the network and get a shell on it. So it's like getting a shell on a, you know, a new Ubuntu box running Apache. Um, in this case, sometimes they'll run Tomcat anyway. So patch and vulnerab vulnerability management is a real problem. Um, just pub publicly accessible devices. Uh, devices like, for example, if you guys remember from the Shodan screenshots, people that are making cameras accessible to the internet when they really don't need to be, right? Like, look at this, um, you know, I mean, if you look at this screenshot right here, right? This looks like some sort of garage or it looks like a tire warehouse. Maybe they're selling tires. 
There's no reason that that should be accessible to the internet, right? Um, here, this looks like somebody's porch of their house. Pretty nice house. Um, this is the inside of someone's house, right? That's a kitchen, I think. Uh, I, I, there's why, why are these accessible to the internet? It really just, it just really doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, um, that's that. Um, okay. So the other thing is unsecured Wi-Fi, right? This is a, this is a, oh, sorry, uh, unsecured DVRs. Uh, you know, one of the things that, so you have two types of, of configurations for a CCTV camera. You can connect to the camera and just stream it through your web browser, which is actually pretty cool, uh, and just watch it in real time. So you'll see security guard booths at, at large buildings. Those security booths will be probably connected to devices and they'll, you know, different cameras and they'll be streaming it in real time. Uh, or those cameras can log to a DVR. One of my findings uh, over the last few years has been uh, finding out that not only are the cameras vulnerable, but the DVRs are vulnerable as well. So there'll be vulnerable versions of services running on DVRs, which are basically nothing than but nothing but just large disks where all of these cameras log to. And these are running Linux typically. And so, you know, what I'll typically do is find an RCE vulnerability, exploit it, grab a foothold on the DVR, and boom, you've got access to all the video feed. Um, administrative interface. Uh, being able to reconfigure the cameras. A lot of the showdown findings that you guys will see in there is you'll find that you can actually send uh, change parameters for the cameras uh, with default credentials. Unsecured Wi-Fi is a really big one. Uh, so, you know, what I've found with organizations is whether they're banks, uh, in some cases casinos, uh, I found that they'll have the CCTV cameras, especially in the parking lots outside the facilities, uh, they'll be connected to Wi-Fi. Uh, so they didn't want to run, you know, fiber or whatever, RJ45 all over the place outside in the parking lot. So they'll connect to a massive Wi-Fi network with Ubiquity or something like that. And I'll find that the Wi-Fi networks are just inherently insecure. Uh, they'll be, well, I found, I found large organizations even running in, in, in one case of casino actually using web web. Yeah, it's still a thing. It's 2020, and there's still CCTV cameras connected to web uh, encrypted wireless networks. So one of the things also that a lot of people don't know is you can actually capture the WPA handshake uh, and crack that key offline. It, it is a thing. There, 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 it is possible uh, to launch these kind of attacks. So just be really careful when you're connecting your CCTV cameras to Wi-Fi networks. Another issue is flat networks. So... You know, in, in the particular case that I was talking about earlier with the bank was, you know, their CCTV cameras, there was one Wi-Fi network and the CCTV cameras were connected to that same Wi-Fi network as the bank. And if you had a foothold on the camera, you were able to access the Active Directory server, the workstations. It, it was just, it was bad. It was bad. Uh, micro segmentation is a really big discussion today, especially with zero trust. So, you know, it's, it's something that I want all of you guys to think about and we'll do, uh, I've, I've done a previous webinar on and a previous vlog on micro segmentation. So again, take a look at my YouTube channel and, uh, you guys can pull that video up, but it, it is important. And what, one of the neat things today, uh, is this idea of SDP or software defined perimeter where before micro segmentation had to be done at the switch level where you used VACLs and VLANs or you set default routes in your VLANs to the firewall and had the firewall route that traffic. Well, uh, today with organization with um, solutions like Stealth from Unisys, as well as uh, other software defined uh, micro segmentation solutions, you can do that at the software level. And I'll talk more about that in, the, in a few slides, but ultimately what they're doing is they're creating these communities of interest with devices and all of those are actually just IPsec tunnels. So it's taking this old concept of, of virtual private networking and VPNs and applying them in a way to create micro segmentation to actually cloak or darken nodes, making them unreachable. Okay, so it, I would be remiss if I didn't cover hacking TCUs and infotainment systems. Um, by the way, as I'm walking through these slides, everyone, please write down some questions, send some questions in. Uh, otherwise, we're going to come up with fake questions and uh, pretend that they were asked. Um, and that's just stupid. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> 
I say what most people think. Um, so yeah, come up with some questions, send them in, and we'll answer Q and A at the end of this presentation. So one of the things that I wanted to do was covering how to hack TCUs and infotainment systems. Now, what these are is when, when somebody says, I'm going to hack a connected car, they're not actually talking about the car. They're talking about electronic control units or telematics control units and infotainment systems, also called head units, within a connected car. So there's different interfaces or different targets or attack surfaces for a connected car for TCUs and head units. Um, with both TCUs and head units, it's typically Wi-Fi. And the type of attacks that you can launch against uh, or have worked for me in, in, in hacking a connected car remotely, I like to focus on attack surfaces remotely outside of the vehicle. You'll notice a lot of vulnerability researchers, researchers in automotive will like to play with the OBD2 port. That's amazing. That's great. I, I don't focus on the CAN bus or the OBD2 port. Um, there's brilliant researchers in this area in Tabor, or, uh, also known by MintyNet, as well as Carfucker. Real name is Robert Leally. Um, they're, they're really good at this kind of stuff. Um, but I like to focus on the remote interfaces like GSM, Wi-Fi. I want to know what I can do to that car remotely without having to sit inside of it. So uh, Wi-Fi and all of these, all of these attacks and all, and and the way to go about securing them are covered in my book. Again, go grab a copy. Uh, the first ten people receive a free toaster. Just kidding. Um, okay, no free toasters. Uh, I also like to focus on GSM, and one of the ways that you can attack connected car or anything with a SIM chip in it is GSM. And a lot of people think, oh, you know, I'm impervious to attacks against connected cars because I don't have a Tesla. I have this, you know, Honda Civic. Anything after, anything made after I think it was 2001 is connected, meaning that's got a SIM chip in it with the, uh, I think it was, I think it was OnStar that really kind of started it all. So, you know, if you control the network fabric of a device, of an IoT device, of anything, of a car, you control the devices that are connected to it, right? If you control the network fabric, if you control the communication infrastructure, you control the device. If you fire up a rogue base station running on your laptop with an RTL SDR, uh, such as like a Blade RF or a Hack RF, whatever, you can actually intercept the SMS messages going between the backend over OTA uh, as long as that car is associated with your rogue base station. These are also known as dirt boxes. For a lot of you out there who are interested in this research, go Google it. It's really interesting. Uh, you will find a few videos on my uh, YouTube channel on this, and also it's covered in my book. But uh, ultimately what you're doing is you're, you're turning your laptop into a fake cell tower, and you're causing the, the car, the car basically by default, any cell phone, any device with a SIM chip in it by default will connect to a cell tower that's projecting the strongest signal by default. It's just the way it works. As you're walking around or driving down the road, your, your cell phone will automatically connect to the, the, the strongest signal. That's what we're doing here as hackers. We're projecting a stronger signal and then the legitimate towers and the car will connect to it and we can then intercept, replay, whatever the message is going uh, over that um, GSM connection. Operating systems, this is another attack surface with connected cars uh, with both TCUs and HUs. Uh, Taking a look at the startup scripts, uh, we found vulnerabilities where things will be written both read only, uh, and then further down in the startup script, it'll be both read only and write. Um, and so, and that's the entire root file system. We've seen private key stored unencrypted and um, basically just right there on the file system for you to import into your keychain. Uh, so yeah, secure key storage is, is another thing you want to look for when hacking these devices. Bluetooth, BLE. I'm working with a company right now um, where I'm going to be, uh, spoiler alert, uh, I'm actually going to be focusing on hacking cars f through physical access, through physical security. So I've got this device where I can capture somebody unlocking their vehicle uh, with that's using BLE capture that signal and then replay it with my device and it'll unlock the car. Same thing with starting the car. Uh, this is how a lot of car thieves now, um, sophisticated car thieves are stealing cars now, high-end cars, is they'll sit somewhere near the car and when you unlock it with your remote, they'll record that signal with their device and then replay that signal. Uh, so I'm working with a company right now uh, where we're going to be demonstrating that type of attack. 
Uh, I also uh, target Bluetooth interfaces for cars, and there's different open source tools um, that you can use to perform that. So let's talk about how to actually prevent these attacks from happening in the first place. So to harden IoT, you want to you want to definitely change the default credentials. It's a big thing. Uh, a lot of times these these companies will not force you to change the admin password when you first set it up. Um, it's an old mentality. It's an old way of thinking, unfortunately. But when you deploy a device, whether it's in your home or in the enterprise, change those default credentials. It's too easy to find out what they are. Uh, make IoT devices part of your patch and vulnerability management program. You need to treat your IoT devices the same way that you treat your web servers. You need to patch them regularly and perform penetration testing against them regularly. They are an ingress point into your network. Ensure that devices are not publicly accessible. Why make a CCTV camera or anything accessible from the internet when it doesn't have to be? Harden your DVRs. Stay on top of patches. Um, you know, don't harden your cameras and then leave your DVRs completely unhardened. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, why hack the CCTV cameras when I can go right to the DVR? Most OT device companies come with administration software for pushing out new firmware updates. Um, this was easily accessible by me. Um, I'll, I'll just name drop them. Access, you know, I went to the Access website. I registered for an account on their support site, and I was able to download their firmware um, update tool to patch my Access cameras. Um, Hardline the devices if possible. Uh, if you if you need to use Wi-Fi, please don't use WEP. Use strong keys. Uh, secure that Wi-Fi network because again, if you own the Wi-Fi infrastructure, if you're able to get that device to connect to you instead of the legitimate Wi-Fi access point, you can grab those keys for offline cracking. Micro segment is it, we should have learned this from the target breach. You know, segment your network, put servers on their own VLAN, put workstations on their own VLAN, put cameras on their own VLAN, put building facilities equipment on their own VLAN. Segment the VLANs using either software-based segmentation or um, you know vacles if you have to, uh, or, or firewall rules uh, at the hardware level. But you know micro segmentation can mean the difference between someone getting a foothold on your cameras and not being able to go anywhere and do anything, uh, and a complete compromise of your network. So with that, I am done talking. Hopefully, everyone can hear me, and uh, yeah. And uh, it's not complete silence. So we'll open up to q and I'm going to be offended if no one came up with any questions. And I'm just going to have to sit here like an idiot and make up questions myself. Uh, and you guys are going to know I made them up because I've just outed myself and told you I would do it. Um, so no such thing as stupid questions. You have one-on-one -on -one time with the Alyssa Knight. Ask me anything. Caroline, you want to jump in here? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I like to use port numbers. This is going to sound really nerdy, um, but I live in a world of port numbers. As a matter of fact, the most common question, if you're ever going to end up in an interview with me, I'm going to warn you right now. I always like to ask, what are the port numbers for certain services? I grew up in the BBS days. I grew up in the days where, you know, you had to actually memorize port numbers. Um, you know, FTP 21 data, FTP data 20, uh, you know, uh, 6667 for RC. I, so I like to use port numbers. So my favorite showdown queries are querying for specific ports because um, for me, you, you know, you never know if someone's going to go in there and actually tamper with or modify a banner, a telnet banner. And when I say telnet banner, I don't mean like literally port 23. I mean like, a telnet banner, you can telnet to say port 80 and, and see that. But um, I don't really like to rely on context queries, like content queries, uh, because you don't know if they've removed the banner or, you know, changed access uh, to something else. Um, so I like to use port numbers. And then I also like to pass, the, um, you know, has screenshot. I'm a visual person. Um, I like to see if anything uh, is actually, I'm actually able to grab a screenshot of any of the results from my queries. Shodan is a really fun tool. Thank you for bringing that up, Mike. Um, I love Shodan. Um, it's, it's some cool stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, you can just do so much with it. It isn't, you can't, you know, you can find a lot more than just unsecured cameras out there. Um, you can find a lot more. So yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I like to search by port numbers. Thanks for that question, Mike.
Yeah, I mean, I can go a little bit more into that. You know, I mean, it, look, it, some things need to be connected to the internet. I get it. I totally get it. But, you know, I mean, if you're going to do that, at least make them only accessible over VPN. Or, you know, there's just no reason to not put anything behind at least a username and password. I mean, if, you, if, if you've if you got to, at least put it behind username and password. Make a simple, you know, an Apache HD access script or something. You know, do something. Uh, don't just make it possible to just connect to port 80 or, you know, limit it to a specific IP address. Um, but, yeah, you know, anything... Anything connected is hackable, uh, you know, even if you put it behind uh, an authentication gateway. Um, you know, the only true way to secure something is to pull the network cable or, or knock it off a of Wi-Fi. But, you know, um, yeah, I would say it's, it's, it's never secure to do that with IoT devices. But if you have to, um, harden it, stay on top of patch and vulnerability management, and make sure you've got it behind authentication. I'm like weird. I'm like weird out with YouTube. I don't know if anyone like. I don't know if anyone's watching from YouTube, but it keeps going back to that stream opening screen. So it just keeps weirding me out. I I don't know. I'm I'm still I'm new to the world of live streaming. So if I'm sucking at this uh, and it's just not working for some of the platforms, hopefully it's working on LinkedIn. Um, I haven't checked that. If anyone wants to pull that up and make sure everything's working. Uh, anyway, okay, go back to questions. Sorry. Hi, Jen. Thanks for the questions, Jen. <laughs> um, ooh, that's a good question. Uh, okay, so this is going to differ depending on the device, right? So ISO 21434, I think it is. Um, so there are some standards in the connected car space. Um, so ISO got together with, um, oh my God. I haven't had enough coffee. Who would they pair up with? I e the so I I E C I so two and forty four was in coordination with someone. Oh my god, I'm gonna get trolled for this. I can't remember. Anyway, there's a new ISO standard that's I think just publishing it draft version at this point for um, a standards framework around cybersecurity with connected cars. Um, it was previously focused just on physical safety, uh, less on security, and there's EVIDA as well. So the EVIDA framework, um, again, this is covered in my book. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I'm not doing that on purpose. Like, seriously, buy my book. That's great. But I, they really, it, a lot of this is covered more in depth in my book. Um, for, yeah, I swear to God, it's not clickbait. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, for cameras, for IoT? I don't know. That's a good question. Caroline? Oh, specifically in healthcare. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so connected medical devices uh, is a real problem. I've done penetration testing in this area. We all remember that, that I don't know if you guys saw that, but a disclaimer or a warning went out to all the hospitals uh, saying that it that, that it'd been discovered that people's connected pacemakers and other connected medical devices were by default connecting to the hospital's guest Wi-Fi network. <laughs> and this showed up in a pen test. Uh yeah, especially an insulin pump. That's not good. Uh, yeah, so in healthcare, yeah, healthcare, God, you know, a standards framework? I don't know, NIST, has NIST come out with something? I don't know. Um, I think it's really just the same kind of hygiene, you know, perform regular pen testing of them, get a get a connected IoT security device. There, There's several uh, new players in this space. Um, you know, interestingly enough, there's a company called Ativo Networks that actually is doing decoys in this area. So Ativo is a decoy technology where it's kind of like a honey pot on steroids. They hate it when I say that, but it's basically a honey pot on steroids. And you're attracting hackers away from your your production equipment to the decoys. And so yeah, so so they're doing this in the healthcare space. With medical device, it's really interesting stuff. So go take a look at it, Jen. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, this uh, that's not really something I've explored in great detail in the past. So I'm not aware of any frameworks. But I think overall, just pen testing regularly, 
um, vulnerability management, patch management, um, you know, subscribing to the vendors that are, that you're buying connected medical devices from making sure that, you know, you're subscribed to their, their vulnerability advisories, uh, and staying on top of them and applying any patches that they publish. I mean, it's, the typical stuff that we're just not doing, right? The typical stuff we just, we keep getting spanked for and we're not doing. We're, we're not learning from our mistakes. Ooh, I do like that one, Vicente. It's like you know me. <laughs> I think I'm actually funnier than I actually am. In my head, I'm like, oh my God, Alyssa, that's so funny. You should say that. And then I say it and no one laughs and it's like, oh my God, I'm, my sense of humor is dry. That's true. That's true. Can you guys just put in the chat, LOL, if I actually am funny? You know, if I'm actually funny, just say I'm funny because it, it, it will help my, my, my self-esteem. Um, uh, full control. So I, I used to live in Stuttgart, Germany, and uh, I worked with, I, I, I can't name them, but several of the large uh, tier ones out there and, and automakers. And uh, I've been in Pendas where I had full control of the car, move the steering wheel, push the brakes and the gas. It's a thing, um, you know, all because of, of that control over GSM. Um, you know, there, there's definitely issues on the manufacturer side where, you know, you've got infotainment systems connected to the CAN bus um, and being able to send or control things with the steering column, um, you know, just, we just need to be doing better. Um, but yeah, you know, and, and that's, I think that's what's intriguing to me in this area. Cause it's such, it's such an arcane area. It's such, you know, it's such a labyrinthine area of, of vulnerability research. You can't just take a senior pen tester and say, Oh, because you know how to hack, you know, IIS web servers, I can throw you into this project and you can hack a TCU and you know, all you need to do is RTFM. It doesn't work like that in, in, in automotive mechatronics. It's you, this is a, a very um, just arcane level of study and, and it, it's just different systems on a chip um, and just the way things work is very different. Um, you know, I, I'm still learning new things every day. Uh, you know, I, I, I learn new things every day from people that are just getting into it. You got to check your ego at the door. Um, you know, you, you have to be willing to learn from anybody. It doesn't matter how long they've been doing it. Um, I forgot the original question. Uh, no, um, yeah. Full control of the car. Uh, yeah, that's, that's totally a thing. Um, but you know, I, I'm developing new tactics and techniques every day. I'm working on a micro bench, um, to, for pen testers of connected cars, um, that has kind of all this equipment and all the software and apps and tools already made, um, if anyone out there is interested in getting involved in that project with me, um, I'm planning on actually creating a container with it um, and making it an open source project and putting it on GitHub. So if anyone out there is interested, contact me. Um, yeah. Okay, that's it. Hopefully that wasn't too much rambling. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I found was you know, I, I got to give credit to a lot of the uh, device manufacturers out there. They actually are pretty good with pushing out new firmware updates when vulnerabilities are published. Um, you know, they, a lot of them are actually starting to get involved into bug crowd and some of the bug bounty programs uh, to have people actively hack their stuff so they can fix it. Um, you know, I would see firmware updates. That's the big thing. It's not like you can log in and do like an RPM package manager with Red Hat, um, you know, with a, with a camera. You can't update RPM packages. You can't go in there and you just run. You need to be on top of the vendor's software and pushing out new firmware updates as they come out um, and just making sure that you stay on top of patches, do regular pen testing. Okay, I get the whole like eat your own dog food kind of thing. Okay, use internal pen testers. That's great. But also remember that they work for you. Uh, switch up your pen testers as often as you can. A lot of them, you know, typically they'll, they'll learn the environment so much that they start to fall asleep at the wheel. They know what to look for. They know what to find. Switch it up. Bring in fresh blood. Bring in new pen testers to do this for you. Uh, because, you know... Is is you do something over and over and over, it becomes repeti you know, it becomes repetition, uh, it becomes monotonous, and it 
you just, you want to bring in a new fresh set of eyes. If I'm working on a pen test and I'm hacking a camera or a car and Vicente is sitting next to me, he and I are going to find completely different things. I'm going to find things that I'm comfortable with and I like to look for because I just kind of have been doing it so long. I, I, I've, I memorize these things uh, and I, and I kind of have a tendency to know, to gravitate towards certain things. And so does Vicente. So would Caroline. So would, you know, anyone who's doing a pen test with me on a car. So, um, you know, one of the things is, is uh, everyone has the tools, the tactics, techniques that they're comfortable with, that they're used to using, and they're going to employ it pretty much in every pen test. So switch it up, do regular pen testing, vulnerability patch management, and micro segment. All the things covered in this webinar. More questions. Yes, I, I would say yes. Uh, Hollywood is not that far off. Um, you know, if we say, if you guys remember Fast and Furious, my son watches that over and over. The last was it Fate of the Furious? Oh my God! I swear to God, I think he put it on. Re I think I watched it three times in one night because he kept watching it over and over. Um, it's yeah, it's a thing. Like you can remotely control a car. You can run a car off the road. It's a thing. This is not Hollywood anymore. And and take it from someone who does it. Like who has done this is this is a thing. Um, there have been vulnerability researchers that have published this very thing on YouTube. You can go out there and Google it. It's it's possible. You guys remember the G Pack? Um, it is a thing, and and yeah, it's not just Hollywood anymore. Uh, you know, I mean, that's a thing for me. That's particular that hits home for me. You know, uh, I I recently just got married, and you know, the idea of being in a car with, you know, or my car, you know, my wife being in my car, uh, and, and a hacker hacking that and running her off the road or running her into a building or into another car. Um, you know, the, these cars are transporting our families. You know, it's one thing to, to deface a website or steal data. It's another thing to hack a car and run it out, run it into oncoming traffic. You know, so this, I think that's why this really means so much to me. Um, you know, why get on a plane and fly it into a building when a terrorist can do it from, you know, their compound in Pakistan somewhere. Ooh, so great minds think alike, alike Mr. Kernow. So uh, for those of you who don't know Mike Kernow, he is like probably one of the smartest people um, amongst the smartest people on LinkedIn, trying not to alienate anyone, but uh, really smart dude. Um, check him out. He's, he's, he's awesome. He's my spirit animal. Um, we've done, uh, we did a previous uh, live stream together on elk and elastic. Maybe we'll do that as the next live stream. I want to do more stuff on Elastic. Anyway, yes, Mike is a super cool dude, super cool cat, um, knows a lot. Um, yes, thank you, Mike, for weighing in there. Um, Showdown is a lot of fun. Um, yes, you can actually find gas pumps uh, out there. Um, so for those of you who are interested, um, there's just a lot of cool stuff in this area. Um, so yeah, keep researching it. Sorry, I'm screwing around with my video. I'm having fun with it. Too much fun. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that again? <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. Sorry. Yeah, like I'm a multitasker. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. And it's true. Um, a lot of IoT devices will actually be micro segmented and not have internet access. So how do you update those? Um so I'm going to address this question the same way I kind of uh, address and, and Caroline, feel free to jump in here. So I'm not the one talking all the time. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to address this with PCI because we've, we actually, Brian and Thorne have built PCI environments and cardholder data environments for our clients. So we were actually um, brought in by Platinum Equity for the cardholder data environment divestiture um, of Transworld Systems. And we came in and we built, we actually built their CDE and we had to actually create multiple zones Hi, Alan. Sorry. Uh, I wonder if Alan's watching. Uh, so um, so we, we created the CDE for them. And we had to actually create multiple layers, get them their, their PCI certification. And um, so we had a PCI zone, a CDE zone. And you know, the, what I would recommend is that 
you know, you create different layers of different security levels. And I was actually recently, ooh, I'm going to talk about this just a little. I'm not going to talk too much about because it it's probably classified and someone will probably kill me and I'll be thrown into a black van and never seen again. Um, so I was invited to the Pentagon uh, to um, work with a combatant command uh, uh, addressing this very topic. And, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I, I discussed was, you know, you guys should have multiple networks with different security levels. So think of it like an onion, right? Think of, think of it like an onion. And the inside core of the onion is your highest security level. Outside from that is your next level down and then moving outwards uh, until you... So basically like 100, 75, 50, 25, and then the internet, whatever. Everything from inside the onion, inside the core, where your IoT devices are, where your critical devices are, should be allowed to go outbound. So you should be able to go from a higher security level to a lower security level, but lower security levels should not be able to go into the upper security levels. You get it? So you should be able to go from higher to lower, but not lower to higher. And the lowest, of course, being the internet, right? Those devices should be able to reach out to the internet and initiate SYN requests or TCP SYN requests, connection requests outbound to those servers to grab their updates and download them. Hard code those IPs, preferably, versus DNS names. Um, we can use your imagination as to why. Um, to grab those updates and then apply them. But never should you let a vendor or anyone from a lower security level to a higher security level to push updates. Should always be a pull, not a push. Um, that is my recommendation. Um, and so, you know, you, 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 in that scenario, you have micro segmentation and you have different security levels and traffic directionality and limit it to port numbers, all that fun stuff. Does that answer your question? Does anyone disagree with that? Caroline, feel free to disagree. Let's have a fight. Let's spar. Let's, let's argue. Tell me I'm full of shit. <laughs> is Alyssa Knight full of shit? Yes. She just makes this up as she goes. Caroline, did we lose you? Caroline, are you on mute? Did she take a bathroom break? Caroline, what happened? Okay. Well, you're just going to have to banter with me then. Mr. Vicente. Yeah, you know, and he, here's another thing, and maybe this will spark some new questions from the audience, but, you know, one of the things that I'm shocked to find, a lot of people don't know you can sniff on a switch. Okay, everyone, I get that not everyone, you know, goes back 20 years in cybersecurity, but a long time ago, how long is it, what, 15, 18 years ago, a, an incredibly smart guy by the name of Doug Song. I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Put it in the chat if you remember him. Doug Song created a tool called DSNF. And what it did is it, it basically overflowed the MAC tables, uh, created a, basically a DOS condition on a switch, allowing you to sniff on a switch. And it turned your expensive switches into a massive single broadcast domain and turned it into a hub. So you could turn, it, turn an expensive Cisco switch into a hub by running this tool. Um, there, since, you know, since then new tools have come out, it is possible to sniff on a switch, everyone. So for those of you who are like, oh, you know, how did you get a foothold on a switch and find all the other devices? You can't sniff on a switch. No one buys hubs anymore. Uh, you can actually sniff on a switch. It's a thing. Um, so if you've been in a meeting or if you're at a cocktail party, don't embarrass yourself by saying, you know, it's not possible to find all the other devices if it's a single network because you can't sniff on a switch. You can sniff on a switch. Any other questions? Come on, guys, we got like three minutes and I don't mind running over. <laughs> you guys have like this one on one time with moi. Don't take it for granted. I'm really not that arrogant. Sorry. Okay. Drop it like it's hot. Drop it like it's hot. Drop it like it's hot. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Let's watch Alyssa Knight dance. All right. Sorry. The containment is getting to me from inside the quarantine zone. There's a great uh, series on Netflix right now called Containment. You guys have to see it if you haven't. It. It's like it's like happening in our world right now. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Vicente. Yeah, like bleeding out of the eyes and bleeding out of the ears like your your cells explode. It's some spooky stuff. 
not that that's COVID-19, but seriously, like I'm in a, I'm in, I'm from within the containment area now. I'm broadcasting from within the containment. Sorry. All right, go ahead. None of you will get that joke unless you've seen containment. All right, go ahead. I'll shut up. Oh, this is such a good question. I believe, okay. I like, for those of you in the audience who know me, you know I'm controversial. I don't give a shit. I will say it. I am, the, okay. You, I don't know. Can I say that you've heard it from me first? I'm going to say it. I'm going to be arrogant and say it. Sim is dying. It is on its way out. It's dying on the vine. Sim will be fully dead soon and everyone's moving to elastic. Sorry. Heard it here first. Um, I like to talk about controversial things. Yes. Um, I am one of those weirdos that believes that it is possible in our lifetime we will see passwords go away. I've been part of this debate for a long time. Um, you know, you've got Trusana out there. You've got all these different companies out there. I'm working with the new startup in stealth mode right now about that very thing. Um, so yeah, um, Mike, you're trying to call me. I'm still giving this live stream. Can't answer your call right now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a thing. Uh, so I do believe that biometrics and stuff will actually, uh, help this attack surface and address this issue. There's some really cool things going on with no the hashtag no password movement. Um, you know, if you think about it, what? How do you guys feel when you leave the house without your cell phone versus leaving without your favorite hat or your favorite sunglasses? You know, you can still leave and be like, "Ugh, forgot my sunglasses." Uh, you know, and not turn around and go back and get them. If you forget your cell phone, some of you guys are going to get fucking lost. Some of you are going to be like, oh my God, uh, I don't remember how to get home. Um, yeah, that's me. Uh, I've lived here for like six months in Las Vegas and I still don't know how to get home from certain places. Um, I need my cell phone with me all the time. Uh, it's one thing to say, well, okay, you know, Hey, it sucked having to carry that fob around, you know, that RSA fob or whatever. Um, now you can just use your cell phone, just having your cell phone on you. There's technologies that have come out now where just having your cell phone and prox in proximity of your computer or whatever, will just unlock your computer just because you've got your cell phone next to you and it's at your computer. Um, being able to hit a, pu a button on your cell phone, uh, that grabs your fingerprint, grabs where on the glass that you stuck your finger, um, all that stuff to prevent replay attacks and man the mill attacks on this kind of stuff. It's cool stuff. There's some cool stuff in this area right now, people. Take a look at it. Um, I do believe we will see passwords go away, especially in Active Directory domains, and move to no password stuff like the companies I mentioned. It is 12.02. I'm wondering if we should go over and keep going or if we should end it here. Did we lose Caroline? Is Caroline completely gone now? You left us. You left me. You left me with everyone to die. I know. What happened to you? Did you take a bio break in the middle of our webinar? Oh, you know why, everyone? She's using Windows. Did everyone notice that my, my shit didn't crash during this webinar? Did everyone notice that? It's because I'm on a Mac. Da da da. It just happened. Who's your boss? She sounds like a real witch. Um,. All right. Yeah, and uh, this has been fun. Like, I actually prefer to just nerd out like this and talk and r just talk about random colloquy and just random shit. So I think I might do this again, but this time without a PowerPoint. I might just get on LinkedIn Live and YouTube Live and Facebook Live and just answer questions. What do you think about that, Caroline and Vicente? I, I think we should do that. Okay, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to commit to this online right now, during the video, during the live broadcast. I'm committing to it. We are going to do a Q&A live from within the containment zone. And before the next show, all of you need to go watch containment on Netflix. And then a lot of my jokes that you think is dry humor will actually be funny. So, um... Yes, we will do a live Q&A next week. Should we do it next week or should we do it like this weekend or like tomorrow? What should we do? When should we do it? Yeah, you know, and we had, do you guys remember the news hitting about that breach that happened where it was like a database full of fingerprints that got compromised? What was it? Wasn't it like a U.S. government? It was like 
CBP, wasn't it? Yeah. CBP's database of fingerprints got got breached. Oh my God, it's happened. Um, CBP CBP got breached. My fingerprints out there. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Like I've, I've had people ask me like, Hey, Alyssa, do you have a smart home? Like, aren't you afraid of being hacked? I don't know. Like, I don't care. Like if my, all I can do is do the best I can and just be able to play with my cool shit. I like toys. Anyone who knows me, Caroline, you know this about me. I like shiny toys. How often do I replace my cell phone? I replace it like every six months. Every time a new iPhone comes out, gotta buy it. New, new MacBook, gotta buy it. New, new iMac, gotta buy it. You know, it's like, I have to buy new cool shit. I have to, I like, I like my toys. And luckily my wife is very um, uh, patient with me with that. Um, she has me on an allowance now. Um, but you know, I, here's the thing. I, 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 I like to play with new cool things. I like connected stuff. I like to be able to be in any room and say, Hey Alexa, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's, it's, it's my thing. And, and yes, that creates an attack surface around my house. Yes. It creates an attack surface around me, but you know, I take that risk. My, my risk aversion is really, really high. <laughs> you should see my stock portfolio. Um, my risk is really high. Um, I manage that risk. I do everything I can. I don't, I don't make my CCTV cameras and stuff and are throughout my house available to the internet without username and password, without, you know, MFA. I have MFA turned on everything. So if any of you want to go out there and try and brute force my password, no, I'm not going to say that, but I have MFA turned on on everything. So, um, you know, and I know that there's been articles that have come out about how you can exploit MFA and how it's not the end all be all. The fact of the matter is there is no silver bullet in security. There never will be. There never was. There's just doing as much as you can and getting off our lazy asses and, you know, turning on MFA. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. Um, but, you know, the MFA Authenticator app for Microsoft, the Google Authenticator app, all that stuff is really cool. And almost everything supports it now. Yeah. All right. So are we going to do Elastic for the net, for the live Q&A? I think we should call it like an hour with Alyssa and Caroline. Or, or what was it? Um, so there was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Alyssa Knight's Neighborhood, or Briar and Thorn's Neighborhood. What should we call it? And I need like one of those dorky sweaters. Anyway, everyone like my new, everyone like my new polo shirt? Like I just got this at, I saw this great documentary on Ralph Lauren and like ever since then uh, my, uh, my wife showed it to me, I've been like obsessed with Ralph Lauren. And um, so I got my new polo shirt. Anyway, all right, that's it. Now that everyone thinks I'm absolutely crazy. Thanks everyone. Everyone stay healthy out there.